Whenever you're ready. Okay, we'll call to order the uh, January 25th, 2018 um, <coughs> meeting of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee. And we'll start with introductions. Bill Daniels. Troy Bollinger. Karen Mori. Mike Mitchell. Sean Dashler. Chris Cook. Lisa Novak. Roger Politeis. Phil Lewis. And first uh, item on the agenda is the annual election of officers for um, positions of chair and vice chair. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, elect Chris Cook as chair for 2018. Second. Any other discussion? <laughs> <laughs> the railroad train's moving. Yeah. Anybody demanding? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And is there a nomination for vice chair? Well, I would like to nominate Lisa Novak. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> All right. And we'll be done at 10 after 7. <laughs> don't think so. No, I don't think so. I'll be her phone. <laughs> Next item is the approval of the minutes from uh, December 7th. Did everybody have a chance to review those? Yeah. Yes. Chris, I've got one tiny... A little correction, just because I think it's important that um, the exact area that seems to be the most serious issue is it. And that's uh, when I made the comment about three different neighborhood associations having talked about uh, vandalism or unsavory behavior or whatever. Um, the minutes say water board park, but in particular, the, the real area of concern is that overlook parking area above the park. I forget the name of the street. Somebody help me. Promontory. 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 Yeah. That, that is the specific area that the three different neighborhood associations brought up, and I think that's what we need to talk to our police department about. So that's the only thing for me. Okay. Make a clarification in the notes on that, Phil? Yep. Okay. Any other comments or edits? Is there a motion to approve contingent on those changes? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Okay. <clears throat> Next item is citizens' <clears throat> comments um, for anything that's not on the agenda tonight. Uh, we do have one uh, citizen comment, uh, Mr. Jim Lacita. Good evening, James Nacita, Oregon City. Um, Interestingly, um, a bunch of my interests are converging tonight, so I'll be commenting on three items. Um, and the first one, um, I'll have uh, PowerPoints on each of one. The first one is um, um, Mr. Mr. Mitchell had invited me um, after I gave a city commission presentation to give a similar presentation to the uh, to this to this body. And um, what I had actually talked about also in some. Um, citizen comment was I made a request to the commission to consider attaching two uh, pieces of city owned property to Abernethy Creek Park in order to give Abernethy Creek Park frontage on Washington Street. Um, the first one is tax lot 2600, uh, which the city purchased um, a couple of decades ago, I think um, as part of its um, plans to reconstruct the um, Abernethy Creek Bridge um, and give it some wider, uh, uh, like a right turn lane to expand Washington Street. So tax lot 2600 isn't actually that wide as, as it seems to be on this map because of that right hand turn. And the other parcel is the um, an un, uh, un uh, vacated and unimproved uh, segment of 16th Street that runs from Washington to Abernathy Creek. Um, and a couple of things got me thinking about this. Uh, one is, one was actually um, the tragedy we had last November when um, uh, the, a homeless lady um, was at a fire. Um, you know, she was keeping warm and, and she died in, in that fire. Um, and I was thinking, you know, Abernathy Creek's a beautiful, Creek Park's a beautiful park, but it's very, you, know, you have to go up to Washington Street and around Abernathy Road and down John Adams Street um, to get to it. It's not very well used. 
and if we could, you know, maybe link it uh, with some kind of footbridge um, from either of those two parcels, um, it would be easier to patrol and it would be safer. Um, and it would also, like uh, 519 there on the left, you can see that's the um, uh, Willamette Falls uh, Hospital Center. And there's a lot of employment um, there now and will be in the future that with a footbridge, you know, that Abernathy Creek Park could be used on lunch hours, for example. And, you know, having it be more used would make it safer as well. Um, and it's just really beautiful, too. Um, you know, on tax lot 2600, you could actually you might put some creekside benches um, um, and link it. Phil, can you? Can you have the clicker next to Oh, I do. How yeah. cool is that? Oh, the on button might not be switched on the left hand side, uh, on the actual side of it. Oh. There you go. Okay. So here's some photographs. Um, this is tax lot 2600. I'm, uh, when I took this photo, I was in the parking lot of the um, Oregon City um, Veterinary Clinic. And the, um, um, you know, that's, that's some nice, you know, natural area right there, but it's just kind of sitting there vacant. And, um, and on, on the right, I just kind of turned to the right a bit, and you can see it slopes down gradually towards um, Abernathy Creek. There's some trash there uh, in the in the trees. Um, I think that would be a better place for a footbridge, just because it, it's a more gradual um, slope. Uh, whereas this is 16th Street. Um, the left-hand photo is um, looking west down 16th, and then I just turned around, and this is 16th Street. I'm standing in the unimproved right away, and you can see how it's, a, it's much steeper down to Abernethy Creek. But, I mean, possibly either could be used, um, um, you know, for a footbridge. And then just having the visibility with some signage on Washington Street saying, you know, Abernethy Creek Park, um, I think um, it would just really um, enhance the visibility and use of, of that park. So, um, thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I'd just like to take a second and thank Mr. Nacita for coming. I did ask him to come and, and do this after I heard this at the city commission, because I had no idea that was city-owned property. Um, and I'm thinking back to the first time I was on PRAC and toured around to a bunch of different parks. And I remember going to Abernathy Creek Park and thinking, man, this thing is beautiful, but you can't get here. So the idea that we could open that up to, to Washington Street, certainly for the security aspects, as he mentioned, but also just what it would do to enhance that park, I think it's a terrific idea. And I know over the years, you know, you hear about, here's a city that puts a surplus footbridge up for sale for a dollar or whatever, and, you know, keep an eye out for something like that and to put a bridge across there, I think it'd be fantastic. So, Jim, thanks again for coming. I think it's a great thing to pursue. Yeah. It's an underutilized park. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wish Doug Neely was here to hear that because I know he spent a lot of time pulling invasives out of that park. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and they are planning on doing another event there uh, this year as well. Okay. Yeah. It's Blackberry eradication. Okay. No other comments? No other public comments. Okay. Uh, next, we have some presentations. Uh, Willamette Falls Riverwalk Master Plan. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to invite up uh, Alex Gilbertson with Metro. She's the um, Willamette Falls Riverwalk um, project manager. Project manager. <laughs> and uh, she's here today to, to talk about the master plan for the Willamette Falls Riverwalk. Um, so I'm going to really quickly bring back up the PowerPoint. There we go. And so um, why we're here today, so we're excited to share the two-year journey that has led us to the plan for the Lamette Falls Riverwalk. <coughs> During that time, we've got to know the site, the community. We believe that the design integrates both into a vision for the future. We're here today to present our master plan document, which memorializes the planning process for the Riverwalk. The document is an aspirational master plan that anticipates future funding, commitments, grants, and fundraising efforts. It anticipates that the design of the Riverwalk 
will be built in phases as funding becomes available. Each phase of the project will submit for individual land use approval. As you are aware, we continue to work through current issues to ensure that the site ownership structure supports delivering the project that are four core values. Still, your approval of support for the master plan is an important step to make in the community's vision for a reality. As the primary agency for funding the draft master plan, Metro Council preliminary reviewed the plan at a work session November 21st, 2017, and accepted public comment until December 13th, 2017. Metro Council adopted the master plan by resolution on January 4th of this year. Staff will bring forward a master plan to the City Commission, Oregon City City Commission, uh, which will be adopted by resolution on February 7th of 2018. We look forward to finishing this process alongside our partners and the public who have helped plan the future of the Riverwalk. This time I'll turn it over to Alex, the project manager for the Riverwalk. She's gonna walk us through the plan. Great, thanks, Bill. Thank you, Alex. Good evening, everybody. My name is Alex Gilbertson. I'm a planner with Metro. And um, as Phil said, I'm here to walk you through uh, some of the components of the master plan. Uh, but first, a little bit of background. Um, as you're aware, upon closure of the mill property, Oregon City, Clackamas County, Metro, and the state of Oregon all came together as the Willamette Falls Legacy Project um, to secure public access to Willamette Falls. And in 2012, the partners identified four core values in order to um, bring this project to life. Um, these values have been used as a framework to uh, make decisions on the project and they will be used as a decision maker moving forward as the project continues. And then one other little piece of background, in 2014, the image that you see on the screen here is of the framework master plan. And this was developed in order to guide future development of the site. The site, Willamette Falls Riverwalk site, is located on the 22-acre Blue Heron property in downtown Oregon City via an easement that was donated to um, donated by the private property owner to Metro on behalf of the project partners. And that easement covers the entire site. Um, in yellow, what you see is PGE's dam. They own the dam and they have granted Metro, again, on behalf of the project partners, an easement option in order to provide public access onto the dam. From the winter of 2015 to present, uh, project staff have been involved in the planning, uh, the, the design, and um, community engagement for this project. And all of the white boxes along the top that have the orange outline, those each represent a planning milestone. And throughout the planning process, we had five large-scale community events as well as an, an online community check-in. Um, in addition to that, there are numerous presentations and facilitated conversations have been held for local groups or organizations, as well as uh, tours of the site. They were offered uh, during this process and they still are offered today. In addition to the public events, the project's outreach also included conversations with agencies and stakeholders to understand the complexities and science of the site. Uh, we also had meetings with focus groups, state partners, as well as the five tribes who have um, present and historic ties to the falls. Throughout these conversations, there have been several consistent themes that we heard from the public. We heard that people desire interactions with nature and views of the falls, materials that respect the existing site character, um, we heard that people desire a central gathering space that supports a variety of community uses. Uh, there was a desire for covered areas for four season shade and rain protection. And we also heard um, that the people wanted to see some interpretive information about the site's history and the cultural ties. 
And throughout this process, we also learned that there's a lot of things that have to be balanced in, in, um, in the middle of the community's desires as well. And as we look at moving the project forward, some things could be, um, some of these could be like conservation priorities or future private redevelopment efforts, um, as well as accessibility or cultural considerations. And so there's a lot of layers to uh, what we are looking at in the design of the Riverwalk. But to sum up what we heard and, and to create some framework around that, what you see on the screen here are the key uses um, which inform and guide the public space of the Riverwalk. And um, these are elements such as falls viewing or tribal access, uh, PGE dam operations is another big one, or again, economic redevelopment. Um, throughout the documentation of this two-year process, project staff have engaged with thousands of Oregonians. And we close this process with a formal public comment period for review of the master plan. We have considered and incorporated requests uh, for activities that would be supported by the Riverwalk and have worked hard to create space for future amenities and economic opportunities that the community values to be developed. We're thankful for, th for the groups and the individuals who provided comments related to the master plan and remain committed to delivering a project that reflects all of the values of Oregon City, the Willamette Falls Legacy Project partners, as well as the community. This design focuses on the partner's goals and the shared core values. And while we call this a river walk, I just want to note that it's more than a river walk. It includes um, more of an integrated system of gathering spaces and pathways, and it's not just a sidewalk. And what you see on the screen here are four renderings that of the final design. Um, for the purposes of today's presentation, I'm not going to go into the details of the design uh, right now. Um, please reference the master plan. And of course, um, I'm here available if you have any questions. But um, OK, so the overall Riverwalk design is an aspirational plan that anticipates future funding commitments. It is anticipated that the design of the Riverwalk be built in phases as funding becomes available. Goals for phase one include providing a prominent view of the falls, providing safe and secure interim access, habitat restoration, and building <coughs> demolition that will prepare the site for future phases. The areas outlined in red indicate uh, the buildings to be demolished to reduce barriers for redevelopment. And the area outlined in blue indicates the phase one area of providing viewing access to the falls in the boiler plant and the uh, mill age building complex. D during design and engineering, we'll look at interim access and we'll finalize an accessible alignment to view the falls. And uh, one thing I wanted to mention about the design, and I'll just jump back to this slide here. Um, this site is among one of the most historic places in Oregon. And the layers of history represented at the former Blue Heron property are very, uh, are, are very deep and explain and help people understand the power of this site. And what, mi what might not be apparent in these four images, but I wanted to call out are the um, historic, historic and cultural interpretation core value of this project and how it's embedded into each one of these designs and will be augmented into each phase of the project. Um, Two significant bodies of work that were completed as part of this project and are included as appendices in, in, the, in the master plan are the cultural landscape report and the interpretive framework plan. Um, the cultural landscape report is a place-based research document that ties information from the public record, so things like photographs or, or, or oral histories, that, that kind of thing, those are tied to a place, this place, the Willamette Falls Legacy Project site. Um, and, and it documents how the site has changed over time. This document is in draft form. It's labeled public draft on the cover of the document. And um, it will remain that way 
because um, when we go through the formal section 106, the federal permitting process, that's when we'll be engaging more closely and more formally with the five tribes. Uh, and we will be revisiting that document during that uh, permitting process to make sure that it is an accurate account of the history of the site. Um, and then the last thing was the interpretive framework plan. That plan used the cultural landscape report as a reference in order to, uh, it's like a guide, or you can kind of think of it as a roadmap to creating an interpretive experience on the site at the Riverwalk. It constitutes an approach, and again, this is a living document that will change as the phases of the project become realized. So I just wanted to point out those two specifically, um, just because it may not be super apparent when you look at the renderings for the final design. Uh, Rediscover the Falls is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that was established in 2016. And they serve as our friend raising, our friend building and fundraising arm of the project. And they are a group of advocates, um, business people, community leaders working to return Willamette Falls to the public in a way that honors historical and cultural significance. Repair the repairs and conserves the natural habitat and strengthens the regional economy. And with the help of Rediscover the Falls, we have approximately $19 million available to fully fund the first phase of construction for the Riverwalk. Um, this effort represents the responsible expenditure of funds that you see on the screen here, which are contemplated in the project partners, the four agencies, in an intergovernmental agreement. So as Phil had mentioned earlier, we released the draft master plan for public comment following a Metro Council work session in uh, late November. Project staff gave this presentation uh, to the project partners at, and at a city commission work session. And we received full support from, from both the partners group as well as the city commission. On January 4th, Metro Council adopted by resolution the master plan and Oregon City is anticipated to adopt the master plan on February 7th. As Phil mentioned earlier, approval of this plan is an important step into uh, moving the project forward. And as we continue to make refinements to this plan um, with, uh, to advance the design following the approvals of this master plan. So I just wanna end here. Um, I'm available if you have any comments, questions, concerns about the, the master plan. And I'm here today stat to um, act on behalf of staff to um, seek the support, the vote of support from this body uh, for the master plan. Thank you. Thank you. And um, maybe at this time, we I know we have a couple of uh, public comments that would like to, to give comment on the project and then maybe we'll ask Alex to come back come up back. and okay. uh, answer any questions or anything at that point. If, uh, so um, at this time, if we could have uh, James Nasita. <clears throat> um, is there any other public comment? Because I'm wrapping up one more slide. Okay, uh, we also have uh, Shelley Perini. Good evening, Oregon City Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee. My name is Shelley Perini, and I am the Interim Executive Director for Rediscover the Falls. Rediscover the Falls, uh, as Alex noted, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that was established to build friends and help raise resources for the Willamette Falls Riverwalk Project. Our mission is to champion a world-class Willamette Falls experience that will offer year-round access to the grandeur of the falls and showcase historic Oregon City. I'm here today to share our support for the Willamette Falls Riverwalk Master Plan. Rediscover the Falls is proud to be the community-based friend building and fundraising arm of the Willamette Falls Riverwalk Project. And in 2017, I had the privilege of leading a robust group of volunteer citizens, businesses, community leaders, and philanthropists to develop Rediscover the Falls 
first major capital campaign plan, which is fueled by the majestic Willamette Falls and our shared desire to create a new landmark for Oregon, right here in Oregon City. So together we set a bold goal to raise $10 million actually to complete a series of signature pieces along the river walk based upon the support and interest secured to date from influential benefactors. We're very confident we can achieve that goal for you to help us prepare for such an ambitious campaign. Rediscover the falls has been leading VIP tours on the last Friday of each month, contending community conversations, special events and supporting our Willamette Falls legacy project partners out in the community. We even hosted a hard hat happy hour tour last May to unveil the new river walk design to a, a select group of patrons. In collective, we have made hundreds of new friends, nurtured new champions, strengthened our board of directors, and cultivated numerous high level donors. While raising money is never easy, selling the majestic Wham Falls takes only one viewing. Once you feel the spray of the falls on your face and you hear that wild roar of the river, you're hooked. As my dear friend and colleague Carlotta Coletta said more than once, this project will give Oregonians and visitors an up-close experience of one of the most beautiful and significant places in the state, a place that the general public has not had access to for almost 150 years. Together, on behalf of my board, we believe we can help make this new legacy happen for you, for our community. Our communities, our economy, and our friends are counting on us, and we're here for you. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Do we have any other public comment at this time? Actually, I don't have a comment. I have a question. OK. Hi, y'all. Denise McGriff. I'm here for several other things. But um, Alex, where are we on the agreement? The last item in the newspaper was that Mr. Heigerkin had not signed it. Has he signed it? Are we good to go? We are still in the good Wait, wait, wait. You have to come Maybe. up here. So <laughs> I'm done. That was, that was my question. Uh, and you can't speak from the audience. Maybe we'll get into that once, so. uh, when she comes up to, to yeah, give so additional, additional information at that point. Uh, Mr. Nasita, would you like to, to give public comment before we move on? Thanks, James Nasita again. Um, this presentation is going to be a little bit longer than my last one, so I'm hoping the chair can indulge me and in, uh, some patience if uh, if I go over um, three minutes, which I think I will. Um, <laughs> Let me ask: Is that uh, Phil? Beep loud when it's at three. Is the microphone on? <laughs> I think it is. Yeah. It should be. Yeah. Um. Okay. Great. So I'll try to. Proceed quickly on this. Um, um, I, again, James Nasita, I live in Oregon City, and uh, I live been in Oregon City 10 years. I live right above the mill um, on the promenade, and um, I've been looking down on the mill on my walks, and, and this project is just such an amazing, amazing project to me, and I think it's great. Everybody who's contributed has been fantastic. Um, Brian and Alex are superb, and I think they've been uh, real additions to the team since they started, um, and I'm just, like, really excited. <laughs> and I want to share some of my enthusiasm, but also make, uh, make a few comments um, to the, to the PRAC um, regarding um, two of the uh, uh, historic um, uh, structures on the site and their role in the river walk one being the Mill G recovery boiler, and the second being the Woolen Mills Pullery, which become, became um, the carpentry shop of Publishers Paper. And I roll through a really quick history of Mill G. It was built in three phases, 1949, 1956, and 1970. 1949 was the original steam plant. You can see it in the left-hand picture with that kind of ramp going up from the corner of the basin. Um, we kind of added capacity to that little boiler with the sm smokestack coming out of it. And it was kind of like an old-fashioned, you know, uh, you know, fuel oil burner, um, good old industrial pollution and all that good stuff. Um, 
1956, um, there was an expansion. Um, you can see there the skeleton going up, and on the right-hand side later it was photographed with the clarifier build, being built in the back. Um, I haven't confirmed it yet, but I think that expansion in 56 was built at the same time Portland Gas and Coke was bringing natural gas to Portland and then became uh, Northwest Natural Gas. And you can see on the map there, uh, feeder line going all the way down to Oregon City, and the article actually mentions natural gas to publisher's paper, and the photo is them terminating on the um, uh, natural gas um, at the mill, uh, and it was the first paper mill in the Northwest to start using natural gas. Um, the, uh, the one I want to talk about mostly, though, is the Mill G recovery boiler, because I think it's amazing. It was built um, to treat it was is a completely different animal from the two previous phases. It was actually built um, uh, to treat Mill C's pollution. Mill C is up in the left hand, upper left hand corner um, of the of the picture on your left, and it was the sulfite mill, and that's the mill that made Oregon City stink like rotten eggs, and it polluted the river terribly with the sulfite liquor. It deoxygenated the river and killed the fish. The, the state struggled um, to clean up the river, and those barges on the lower right-hand side were used to basically put the liquor on a barge and tow it to the Columbia River and just dump it and try to dilute it. Now, inside Mill C, those are the digesters. That's a 1927 picture of a digester I found. Um, but this is really an amazing story of environmentalism in the United States because in 67, we passed our Water Quality Act that became the model for the Federal Clean Water Act. And this is what happened. This is a very complicated um, Mill C recovery boiler that was built basically to treat Mill C's waste. You can see the barges are gone because Mill, uh, the recovery boiler, which as you can see um, on the right-hand side, it's, it was built right next to the first two phases of Mill G. Um, but it was a, the contradiction between the two thematically is just incredible to me. Um, the irony of you know the old style pollution and the you know the the environmentalist recovery boiler being built in 1970, um, you know years before the Clean Water Act was passed. Um, so here's here's where this really gets um, kind of like a complex decision making process and. Um, you know, um, I really appreciate what Alex talked about, you know, this being conceptual and, and, and subject to further um, consideration as time goes by. In the Riverwalk, um, Mill, it, it's genius to me what they've done um, with uh, Mill G and then Mill H on the right-hand side, especially with the Mill H part with the trees growing up out of the middle. It's kind of like nature retaking over the industrial um, <laughs> polluting industry, and I think that's just, just like super cool. Um, however, in, um, as far as Mill G, the Riverwalk plan right now, it only retains the first two phases, but does not retain the recovery boiler. Um, and part of the reason for that is, I'll go back a bit, when they built Mill G, or just before, they actually buried that tail race, which is a super important part of, you know, opening up the environments again. Um, and the balance, you know, between retaining the structure and opening up, um, um, uh, you know, the tail race again, it's a, it's a super, it's a tough decision. It's a tough call. Um, so is there an opportunity to retain, you know, that what to me is like a super important part of the whole environmental theme of the River Walk with um, our state water quality statute and how you know that was reflected in the recovery boiler, um, and still open up the tail race. So in various scenarios that has been considered on the left is um, from the 2014 master plan, you can see Walker Macy actually had a scenario of D, which kept the recovery boiler, and it looks like shifted the tail race a little bit in order to daylight it. And the current um, framework plan actually had a scenario that chose the recovery boiler, 
kind of like shortened and um, um, having the tail race go through the bottom of it. Um, and you can see where the channel is um, buried. If you were to open the channel, you could still see, you can still see the recovery boiler there, and it just kind of looks like there you could ha you could actually have both. And then on the drawing on the right, um, I think again this is genius. I mean, the, having the tail race go right up to Mill C, um, where the where the digesters were, where the pollution was, and it's almost like again just like the plants coming out of Mill H, having like the fish vanquish everything, you know, having the nature go right up to that uh, historic pollution side of Milsey, I think just that's, that's just really cool. Um, I wonder um, if it might be possible to really grapple with conceptually whether it would be possible to retain at least part of the recovery boiler to have that kind of like that Milsey, Mil G linkage, you know, how they um, were linked thematically, you know, over history. Uh, by that tail race, but still allowing us to interpret the site, you know, and the recovery boiler to me is like a super part of that interpretation. So the other thing's much shorter. The pullery um, is Blue Heron's oldest building that's on the left, this 1970, it was built in 1903. On the left, it's a 1917 picture. On the right is today, and you can see the pattern of the little chimneys is the same on on both, I think it was shortened when Mill O got built. Um, um, but the river walk in this case, um, um, you know, early on in the project, it was just going to be wiped out. And I really credit staff and uh, the current consultants for wanting to retain the pullery as part of the, that public plaza. Um, <clears throat> I'm hoping consideration could be retained to retain the four corners of it, where right now it's split in half. Um, you can see it right there in the middle of the plaza, just kind of like half of a building. Um, I don't know what's gained by not retaining the four corners of the building. I mean, if you wanted it in open space, you could have, you know, one slope of it being like a glass roof, you know, for, you know, to shield from the rain, but still allow the open feeling. Um, and the interior of the pullery has some really nifty old growth beams and timber work that um, you know would be nice to retain too. So to conclude, I was hoping that um, the PRAC might consider recommending exploration of retention of the four corners of the pullery and retention of some or all of the um, LG recovery boiler as well. A lot to chew on. And thank you for your patience. Uh, so at this time, we'll uh, invite Alex Gilberson back up. And if uh, the committee would like to ask questions or have any comments in regards to the master plan. <laughs> can, you tell, can you tell us more about the question that, or the answer to the question that Denise asked? Sure. <laughs> yes, thanks for your question, Denise. Um, Thank you. I uh, would like to start out by saying yes. In the in the newspaper, everybody saw that there was a disagreement with the property owner. Um, he's uh, failed to sign our permit applications, and so um, we are currently in negotiations with Falls Legacy, and uh, we are trying to come to an agreement uh, at this point about how and what it looks like to move the project forward. Um, in the meantime, we're here today to present the master plan to get your vote of support so that when we go to Oregon City Commission uh, next month and um, seek resolution from them, uh, we're just getting one step closer in order to be able to, quote unquote, like act immediately um, once we receive that agreement. Is that helpful? It's a little vague. I have. <laughs> Is he going to sign it? You think? Uh, we are hopeful. We. Um, That's the last we, I heard. Yeah. Is he waiting for a master plan to be? No, 
Is he is not, no. Do we know why he's hesitant? He, he has some uh, concerns about some areas of the plan that we feel we have addressed, and um, we are still trying to work through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you take a moment and kind of address Mr. Nasita's two recommendations? Are those things that are the way the plan currently is, are they locked out or are they vague enough that they, they're still on the table for research? Uh, yeah, I think anything is still on the table um, with the plan. And um, we have talked to Mr. Nasita specifically about the pol Polary building. Uh, and I think that those comments um, are valid and can be incorporated. Um, we, um, the recovery boiler is a, a new concept that I heard tonight. Um, uh, would, we'd have to look into that, but the reasoning for um, the plan showing it as removed um, at this point in time is um, because, like I had mentioned in the presentation, there's always a balance of what you can and can't retain. And um, w when we're looking at that specific tail race, um, the the benefits for habitat and fish and water quality um, in in the scenario that we have presented, um, we kind of looked at that and it outweighed the um, the need to retain that structure. And so that was the reasoning for why it was shown as removed. Um, again, it's a it's a concept plan, and as we get into future phases of the project, um, it can be re-looked at. Um, however, in the phase one that has been identified um, for the first phase of construction, neither the Polary building or the recovery building um, are considered part of that phase one. Okay. So so nothing would happen to those as part of phase one. Is that what you're saying? That is correct. Okay. Well, and I'll say, I think I only missed one of the various city meetings and public <laughs> meetings and you name it. Uh -huh. um, and when I started looking at the pictures at OMSI, I was absolutely overwhelmed. Um, I had, my personal opinion has been most everything down there other than the five designated buildings just needed to go away. Mm. That's not a well-built plant. Mm -hmm. It was at one of the jokes from uh, a former Blue Heron employee is there were a lot of structures that were just basically put up to protect a machine. They weren't that intended to yeah. be buildings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> However, I have to thank Jim. I've never gotten a peek inside the carpentry shop and I've ah. heard the wood is beautiful. Now I really want to peek inside yeah. the carpentry shop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I've been so impressed I, and it is a beautiful balance. You're returning some of the property to nature. Um, I had no idea you'd be able to save <clears throat> Mill O. I didn't think that was on the drawing board and it's a lovely idea to open it up and give you some out of range space, mm -hmm. um, skinning the boiler building and being able to actually, you know, the bones are attractive of the uh, building. The what's on top of it mm -hmm. right now is not, mm -hmm. um, but opening the those up to be viewed is incredible. I don't think it's anybody else's place to start second guessing you on keep this, keep that. I think what's going to happen is you're going to get in there and there is a hundred thousand million tons of concrete, rebar, rusted there metal, yeah. you know, rusted bolts and who knows what else when you get into actually trying to remove some of those structures and modify some of those structures. So I think reality may dictate some changes to your plan, but I certainly wouldn't at this point, make any recommendations to change your plan. And you guys have done a really good job. Thanks. I have two questions. You commented about the tail race. Uh, Mr. Nasita wants the polary um, retained, but I trust that a lot of, well, I know a lot of work has gone into this. I've been kind of part of it and observing it from afar, but I'm sure there's a reason that that was not as part of the master plan already. And I'd like to hear that that is. The polar retained? Yeah. Uh, well, we have um, actually shown it, and, and Mr. Ms. Nasita actually had the graphic that zoomed in. Um, we haven't retained the structure in its entirety. Um, it's been repurposed with the same 
um, like the salvaged timber, the lumber from mm -hmm. um, the polary into a new use uh, in, in the central focal point of the plaza. The current structural capacity of the building is not um, super strong at this point to so that retain was the reason, it. That's the reason you weren't retaining it. But in we felt plan. that it was important to keep it as an icon or a focal point um, within the project design. Okay, and then the second one I have is, um, it took us a long time to get to this point. And I think the master plan looks beautiful. And if we redo it or adjust it, what does that can do to our timeline? I know we're not at this point in a crunch because we're waiting on a signature and some other things. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it will further delay the program and you, and you guys have done a tremendous amount of work to kind of vet out a lot of opportunities. And I question what it would do then to the process to then relook at things and possibly redraw some stuff. Correct. Um, well, as far as the phase one area that's been defined, um, I, we don't foresee many changes happening to that plan um, to move forward with the first phase. Um, each phase that we would go through would be kind of its own separate project that we need to go through individual land use approval um, here at the city. And so each project or each phase is going to be on its own separate timeline. As far as meeting a timeline for phase one, I don't, we don't foresee significant design changes. So remind me again, I'm the new guy here, so I'm trying to put everything together. At this, the recommendations that Mr. Nisida is making, what phase are those happening in? Uh, they have not been identified yet. They're, they're outside of phase one. Outside of phase one, yes. so we do know that part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you need a motion? Uh, if there's no other comments or questions, um, we would... I, yeah. I, had, I, had, I did have one other additional question, actually and I probably yeah. should know this answer. <clears throat> we know that Oregon State Parks has an investment in the area, a financial investment, and do we, do you recall how many acres it is that they're interested in? Are they interested in physical real estate in that? Oregon State Parks? Yes. Uh, no, they have granted the project um, money to fund the construction, but they're not interested in purchasing the yeah. um so am I to assume that the public space is is going to be uh, monitored, or shall I say, um, under the control of Metro? Uh, n well, it would be a combination of the project partners, and uh, we are still trying to kind of figure out okay. what that structure looks like. Okay. Yeah. And how many acres is that? The entire site is 22 acres. Yeah, and then a portion of that, of course, is going to be commercial. Uh, yes, that is correct. There is private redevelopment happening on the upland portions of the site mm -hmm. um, that would be guided by the private property owner. So is that roughly 25% is public uh, um, access, or is it, uh, could you do this? Uh, I guess I don't really quite know the breakdown of it. The area that is shown in the river walk itself is mm -hmm. the areas of the site that would be um, more inundated with flooding if flooding were to occur. And I want to say it's maybe um, a little less than half of the property. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, so are we looking at the whole plan or just phase one? Well, the whole plan, the whole master plan is uh, the process in which we've taken over the past two years to develop the preferred plan. Um, so the master plan kind of outlines that whole process and it also does include phase one. And so um, we would be looking for a vote of support for the full master plan. Okay. Yeah. Then I move that we recommend the city commission adopt <clears throat> The Willamette Falls River Walk Master Plan is currently presented. Second. Okay. Oh, any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Make that recommendation. Great, thank you. Thank you. One thank more you so tiny comment, and you kind of alluded to it. It really does need a grander name than River Walk. <laughs> no, seriously, you know, it's a marketing thing, it's a fundraising mm -hmm. thing. Um, uh, there's interest in this thing all across the state. Mm -hmm. um, and people, people are like, well, it's a, it's a river walk. Just build it. Why is it such a big deal? Well, it's because it's a big deal. It's, yeah. not, just, <laughs> yeah. it's not just a walk. It Agreed. really does yeah. need a better name. It's more That's than a walk. Thank That's you true. for your comment Way on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, a good point. That's it. Okay. We'll give you Thank, Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah there you go. So is that, is that all of 6A? So that, yes, that's all of 6A. Okay. So the next agenda item is 6B, the McLaughlin Caninema Trail. Uh, so at this time, we'd like to invite uh, Kelly Reed, Oregon City Planner, uh, to discuss the McLaughlin Kanema Trail Plan. Thank you so much for inviting me or letting me come to your meeting tonight. Uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, so I last saw you uh, regarding this project in September, and uh, a lot has happened since then. Uh, so I'm here to give you an update um, on that and uh, also, like Alex, ask for um, a, a recommendation from this group to the Planning Commission City Commission who are the reviewing bodies for this uh, project. So at the Planning Commission, uh, at the first Planning Commission hearing, um, for this trail, it happened in November. Uh, we presented uh, the the plan, probably very similar to what you saw in September. Uh, presented that to the planning commission, and we heard a lot of um, public input from folks that we hadn't heard from before, uh, which was really great. You know, you get a public notice in the mail and. You know, you show up to a meeting and it, and it works. Uh, and so we, we heard from a lot more people. Um, and the Planning Commission recommended that uh, we uh, come back to some of the groups that we had talked to previously uh, and um, that we, you know, think about some of the comments that we heard at that meeting. And so um, we did hold another advisory group meeting uh, in December. Um, some of you were there. Uh, we met with uh, folks from the VFW, and uh, we went back to the Transportation Advisory Committee last week um, and the Natural Resources Committee earlier this month. Uh, so the Planning Commission acknowledged that, you know, we had spoken with PRAC, we had spoken with TAC, but really would have liked to see, have seen uh, a recommendation from you. And so that's one reason I'm here today. Um, and so I'll, I will just summarize uh, the plan. I don't, I, don't want, I don't want to rehash things that you've already heard, um, but I'll tell you kind of what's changed since the last time you saw this. And we do have some new members of the committee who might not have seen the previous version. Okay, just for okay thanks. Uh, so the purpose of this trail plan, the McLaughlin to Kanema Trail, uh, was to connect some of our existing city amenities and assets, including the Kanema Children's Park, Old Kanema Park, McLaughlin Promenade, and the Willamette Falls River Walk, which uh, I'm sure you saw in the master plan, includes a future pedestrian bridge that would come up from the mill site and uh, land essentially on the, on the promenade. And so this trail would really connect those four places. Uh, the trail was anticipated uh, in our 2013 transportation system plan and in our 2004 trails master plan. Uh, and in the trails master plan, it uh, connects up to the Oregon City Loop Trail, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And so we started off earlier in 2017, uh, formed an advisory committee uh, of a lot of local stakeholders, and uh, we started off with a little site visit and, you know, really walked the area. Um, so we have got some parts of this trail, the corridor, that are really wonderful places already, like Old Kanima Park. Uh, and then we have other spaces that are not really pleasant environments for people to walk and bike, um, not necessarily safe, and don't have infrastructure. Uh, and then we have a very unique uh, historic district that um, has very calm, narrow streets, uh, but lacks sidewalks. Uh, and so it's a, that presented a challenge for us to figure out what to do in this historic district to keep that character uh, without um, and, and add uh, safety amenities. <coughs> 
Uh, so we, we looked at a variety of options um, and alignments, uh, including South End Road and um, Highway 99. And this is just a summary of all the community engagement that we've done. In addition to the advisory group meetings, uh, we've seen the McLaughlin Neighborhood, Kanema Neighborhood Association, um, of course, PRACTAC, the Historic Review Board, uh, and we're, we're not done yet. And so the community advisory group uh, was about 16 members. Uh, we had representation from a lot of the existing city boards and committees. Uh, VFW, PGE, ODOT, uh, and local residents. Uh, and one of the more exciting um, community, I guess, outreach events that we held was Greenway for a Day. Uh, during the summertime, we asked people to come out and walk the trail alignment, and we kind of lined it with cones, and we closed off Kanima to through traffic. And uh, we had uh, more than 80 people come uh, to that event and participate and then give us feedback on their experience. Uh, we also asked them to take surveys. We got a lot of good data from that. Uh, and part of that event also was a um, ivy pole in Old Kanima Park uh, that was very successful and um, you know really showed the folks that came to Greenway for a day that Oregon City cares about its parks and wants to take care of them. And so what we heard uh, during the Greenway for a day was that uh, most people's favorite part was Old Kanima Park. Um, a lot of people had no idea that that park existed uh, and that um, people want to connect to their neighborhoods to downtown and, you know, would local residents would really use this pathway. And so we looked at a variety of these alignments. Um, I'm not going to go into too great a detail, but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them afterwards. Uh, so we looked at three major alignments and um, had a set of evaluation criteria. And we ended up with uh, a recommendation that includes an interim trail and then a slightly different permanent trail, knowing that you know, there are some maybe easy things that we can do early, and then there are some longer term improvements that might cost a little bit more money that we really couldn't afford to do right away, but maybe could do in the future. So the interim trail recommendation is come off of the promenade uh, from on 2nd Street, walk down High Street to South 2nd, and then cross South 2nd either at that four-way stop at High Street or walk to 99 next to the still house and cross there, uh, and then walk along 99 in front of PGE um, into Old Kanima Park and then through Kanima via 3rd Avenue, Ganong, and 4th Avenue. Uh, of course, some improvements to these areas would, would be required before we can really call this a trail, uh, including traffic calming and improving safety along McLaughlin. Uh, so here's that connection from the promenade to 2nd. Along 99, we would be adding some sort of physical barrier for pedestrian safety. Uh, and then doing some traffic calming in Kanema, including changing that speed limit to 20 miles per hour. <coughs> in the long term, the uh, permanent recommendation uh, has changed a little bit from what you um, just, from what you saw in September. And so, um, the first thing that I'll talk about is uh, the VFW, um, the, per the permanent trail instead of uh, going out on High Street would try and keep a more direct route uh, that would continue to the very end of the promenade, go through the VFW parking lot and then utilize um, the driveway through some sort of uh, side path or expansion of that driveway to create the space uh, for the trail. Uh, originally we had talked about um, potentially changing the vehicle entrance to the VFW. Uh, but following that planning commission meeting, we met with folks from VFW and kind of talked through the options and went back to the advisory group. Um, and everyone kind of felt that going, via, going via the driveway was the best route and that we don't really want to consider moving the vehicular access at this point. Uh, instead, just adding uh, a trail parallel to that driveway. Uh, so that 
currently looks like this. It's pretty narrow, it's steep. The visibility is not great. So if you're walking down and a car is coming up, um, that could be a bad situation. So uh, we'll be looking to um, eventually get some sort of widening side path along um, probably the river side of that because you can see the basalt <laughs> outcroppings on the other side. <laughs> uh, um, so that's um, the slight change that we made there. Uh, and then um, along with this, uh, which I think has been the plan all along, is uh, closing off the left turn from 99E to Tumwater. Yay. Um, <laughs> so if you have people walking down that driveway and onto Tumwater Drive, um, then you won't an any longer have that conflict of cars kind of really pulling in quickly off of the highway and trying to beat the light. Uh, so oh, we've worked with ODOT. We've had some meetings with them since uh, the summer and fall, and they're all on board for that plan. Um, and they even might try and um, implement that sooner rather than later uh, because they'll be doing some projects in the area this year um, where they'll have to close a lane of, of 99. And so they said, well, if we're going to close a lane for this, why not just you know do this at the same time and get it done? So um, we might, fingers crossed, see that happen soon. Goodness. Uh, and of course, we'll work with We'll make sure that folks know about it, VFW Museum, you know, the, the neighbors that probably use that turn sometimes. Um, we'll make sure everybody knows about it. Um, the other thing that changed with the permanent alignment is this area here with the multiple dotted lines. So originally we had uh, thought that we could use, we could kind of extend Tumwater Drive go behind future redevelopment in that area because those properties are all zoned for mixed use and you know we could see those develop um, into you know nice residential commercial uses in the future uh, and what we heard from those property owners is that you know they uh, they were uncomfortable with seeing their properties you know bisected by this trail and um, even if we intended for flexibility in that it's still um, wasn't the best uh, plan for them. And so we um, talked about that at length with the advisory group and really re realized that these, the, this rede potential redevelopment is so uncertain and so far into the future that it really um, made more sense to keep more flexibility and have show multiple options. So what we're showing is that the, the permanent trail could take the same route as the interim trail and keep stay along 99. Of course, be probably a more robust trail um, up there. Um, or it could go behind the development, really skirting the edge of that, that or the bottom of that cliff uh, from South End Road. Um, and then there are various ways that it could utilize Tumwater Drive or not utilize Tumwater Drive. And so that's why you see multiple options there. Um, knowing that the permanent trail is probably far off into the future. Um, the remainder of it, uh, really, we, were, we would work with PGE to get um, a license agreement to utilize their property. We'd widen the trail in Old Kanema Park. Right now, it's five and a half feet wide. Um, the intention is a 10 to 12 foot wide path. Uh, and then we'd uh, keep the same alignment in Kanema. Um, the other thing that we added was um, we have the, the future river walk, that little green line there, uh, which has always been um, part of the river walk plan. Uh, but we added this blue extension just to acknowledge that when that future phase of the river walk is built, uh, that we would like to uh, make sure that it's connected as well um, so that it kind of creates a loop, uh, a nice loop trail. And so, um, once you get from the VFW driveway down onto Tumwater, there's room to add a 10 to 12 foot side path and keep the, both of those travel lanes so that people can still get you know, into the museum parking lot, um, into the VFW driveway and um, in, increase or um, provide on-street parking on both sides still, uh, which I think the museum is ha should, would be happy about. Mm -hmm. I was gonna ask that. Uh, and then, 
this is a one option for how we could cross South Second. Uh, it's totally conceptual, um, and it's uh, not something that we're adopting as a plan, but it's just a rendering of, of what could be. Uh, and then if we do continue on Tumwater, uh, then there's room for a nice side path, and then what you see here is future redevelopment that we think should orient itself towards a trail if the trail goes back there um, so that there are more eyes on the trail. Uh, so I'm going to skip through these slides because this is what the Planning Commission and City Commission are dealing with. It's the legislative amendment to um, amend our transportation system plan and our park uh, trails master plan to kind of reflect this, this plan. Uh, and so we would amend the TSP project list uh, and then we would amend the trails project list. Um, and this is the exact words of how we would do that. Um, the, uh, we, and one thing I just want to point out, um, because I'm talking to Prack, is that uh, we revised the description of the McLaughlin Kanema Trail um, to, to be consistent with the plan and then actually revise the description of the Oregon City Loop Trail to include the McLaughlin and Kanema segment. Uh, the way it was defined previously kind of had it looping around the whole city and then stopping somewhere in the Kanema Bluff and Metro's property. Um, but uh, we thought it made sense to really connect it all the way to uh, the Willamette Greenway and the Willamette River. And so um, we kind of bring it all the way up to fully connect it to the promenade. Uh, and adding this project as a, um, an official regional trail or as part of a regional trail gives us more ability to apply for grants uh, in the future. Uh, so as far as the next steps, uh, I want to rewind um, and talk about one more thing. Uh, so this crossing of South Second, sorry, I want to go back. Um, I said this was conceptual. One thing we heard from the committee is that um, this might not be the best place to cross South Second. Uh, we kind of need more of a, a transportation engineer, you know, looking at this in greater detail and doing a study. And maybe it would turn out that it's not the best idea. And so um, we want to keep that flexible. Maybe the best crossing is really at 99. Maybe it's at High Street. Uh, and so we're rewording the plan to be a little bit more flexible in that way. Uh, and then um, the group also wanted to recommend to PRAC that uh, you update or kind of open up and take a look at the um, trails master plan from 2004 and potentially also the parks master plan. Because uh, we heard a lot of great ideas for nature trails in the area that were a little bit outside the scope of this project, but were definitely legitimate good ideas, um, including, you know, trails that would connect into um, Old Kanema Park, trails that would come from uh, city-owned property uh, into Kanema Bluff area. And so um, that's a recommendation of the advisory group that, that the city, namely PRAC, um, maybe take a look at this uh, at some point in the future. So um, I'll go all the way back to next steps now. Uh, so we've got a lot of a lot of work to do from here. Um, so this is just a master plan, a conceptual plan, uh, and so um, we almost have a to-do list here, um, and who would work on it as well, uh, so that we know how to how to move this forward. Questions. I'll make a comment. Go ahead. Just, uh, I, I think the concerns that I had regarding the VFW parking lot, you guys have clearly addressed that. I appreciate that. Uh, took out some of the specifics, really, mm -hmm. and just made it a little more broad because our concern was that it would uh, happen so far down the road that we didn't want to be locked in on one specific idea, and I think you've addressed that perfectly. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Bill? Uh, other uh, Regulations to follow regarding ADA compliance on this trail? There are, and um, it's 
this is a unique trail. Some of it's using existing streets. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, of course, our goal is to always meet ADA guidelines, but some of our existing streets, of course, as you know, don't and can't. So, for example, in Kanima Ganong Street, you know, utilizing that, it's absolutely not ADA, but um, we strove to use the flattest <coughs> route possible. Um, all three of those options that we looked at uh, had some little segments that were really steep. So we avoided the steepest ones. Um, and of course, the VFW driveway as well. Um, you know, we, we just have to deal with that. And uh, there are ADA, the, the guidelines do allow short bits of steeper areas, but we probably can't meet it uh, in the ideal way. That was ex exactly my question. The other comment, and um, actually I like the idea, um, it was one of the slides that was shown on the second street crossing with the raised sidewalk and the island but I realize that, that that's conceptual, but I think that's a great idea. Um, as someone who crosses a lot of intersections, having that island to be able to you know, have a break between traffic and be able to monitor traffic. So I'd like to see more of those, just a comment. So thank you. Yes. I have a question. Sure. You mentioned Tumwater. I love turning left off McLaughlin on a Tumwater. <laughs> Um, and the reason the reason I love it is because I avoid the mess up ahead, mm -hmm. which is what it's designed for. Mm -hmm. So if we take that away, we've added to the mess up ahead. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, while you propose to close one, what have you then proposed to fix the problem it creates? Yeah, so um, we, we, we went straight to ODOT with this idea. You know, they were at the table from the very beginning, and um, they have concerns about that turn um, because they see a high level of uh, crashes there, um, you know, higher than other areas. At, at Tumwater or up? At Tumwater. At, okay. Uh, and so they um, said, we'd love to cross it, but we need to check and make sure it doesn't adversely impact that intersection at South 2nd. So they did run those, those numbers and they determined that the impact was so little because actually very few people use that left turn. Um, I love it for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it works well for me. Yeah. Uh, but they, um, they wholeheartedly support closing it. And I think they said that uh, it would add at most one, one second average of more delay waiting to turn left at the light. And so that was acceptable to ODOT. Okay. And it definitely creates a sanctuary for pedestrians without traffic, yes. not uh, having to hurry up beyond the line. That's a big queue on 99. It's a large queue, left turn lane only, and that's a long light. Um, I don't know the seconds, but it's, it's, it, it's, I always thought, I always wondered why Nancy Crushauer decided to, with ODOT, to, to uh, allow them to take that shortcut, unless there was an opportunity for some reason that they need to make a temporary mm -hmm. adjustment in using those um, uh, cement barriers to yeah. move when they needed to. But yeah. uh, it will remain uh, an emergency access route in the event that there's a rock fall it's further south on 99. So mm -hmm. large semi-trucks would actually use the Tumwater Drive to turn around and go back north on 99. Um, and so it's not, it's not like we can build a, a wall there and totally close it off forever. But um, we're talking with ODOT about gate, a gate or bollards or, you know, something to that effect. Mm -hmm. So it'd be a no left turn, not a blocked okay. road? Correct. Essentially. Okay. Any other questions? We okay. do have a public comment as well, if, okay. if there aren't additional Let's questions. Uh, so we have uh, Jim Nasita, <coughs> public comment. Okay, last one. <laughs> James Nacito, Oregon City. <clears throat> so I think I could probably do all I need just with this slide. Um, <clears throat> is there a pointer on this too? Yes. How does that one work? Uh, I think at the top, I believe. Okay, great. You have to look up here. Can you this. zoom in um, <clears throat> at all? Um, so I, I just want to get like around Kanima for this. Oh, sorry. No, 
know. I don't know that I can. Okay. Oh, there you go. There you go. <clears throat> Wonderful. Oh, whoa. Why don't you zoom out just a bit there? Okay. Oh, okay. So, and um, this, yeah, there you go. <clears throat> okay, so I'm, um, I'm going to talk some more about um, unimproved and unvacated right of ways. Um, I wanted to chat um, so the, there, you know, the, um, the design for the Kanema Trail. I, I think it goes fourth. Is it fourth out of Kanema Park? Um, the reason I want to show this slide is because of this parcel. It's called the Budwin parcel. This was purchased by the uh, city commission in 2010, specifically um, to be integrated in, into our park uh, inventory. And Metro has purchased uh, the Kanema Bluffs area over here. What it does basically is create a really nifty opportunity as far as the Kanema Trail for a loop um, through the Kanema Bluffs property back this way. And you can see these um, shaded right-of-ways are, again, unimproved um, and unvacated right-of-ways where um, we could utilize them to add to the trail system. Um, this one here um, going all the way down again towards Old Kanema Park um, um, or through, you know, any of these. Also, we were interested in buying these two properties, but we were um, unable to, to, to purchase those as well. Um, but yeah, another alternative might be taking the, uh, a loop trail all the way up to, uh, to Coffee Creek and then down again, down this way to Old Canadian Park. Um, I'm wondering if um, Prack might consider uh, uh, a recommendation of adding this kind of scheme to the current planning for the um, Kanema Trail um, for this reason. Uh, if it's planned, a lot of this is super steep below South End. Um, but I think, and this one I think is a lot that has the old Kanema Waterworks, which really should be a nifty amenity along some kind of trail. But if it's in integrated into the plan, it might be susceptible to like a dedication requirement under our codes if these properties are ever um, redeveloped. Um, and it would be you know, unfortunate to lose that opportunity for a dedication requirement. Um, um, by waiting too long. I think actually one of these two parcels is, on, is for sale right now. So they could, you know, come up for a land use approval in the next, you know, two or three years. Um, and finally, um, one, you know, in thinking about all these right-of-ways, um, I'm wondering if, the, if PRAC might consider also a, a new project where inventories in the cities, all of these um, unvacated right-of-ways and which can be really be used for trails and have a plan whereby you, de you designate some of these as future trails and, you know, in the McLaughlin neighborhood and, you know, uh, in um, the original plat, figure out which ones can be used as trails and then for the rest of them create a program because I don't think we charge when we vacate streets. Um, and if someone wants to add a part, you know, to their half acre or a quarter of an acre, I mean, why are we giving away this stuff for free? If we, if we had a program whereby we actually charge something as part of a formal program, if someone wants to add an, an unvacated street to their lot, have them pay something into a fund that could go to, you know, improving some of these trails on unvacated right-of-ways. So I offer that idea. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. And we also have uh, Tom O'Brien would like to give public comment. <clears throat> Is it possible to pull up uh, the oh. map that was shown earlier showing the intersection of Tumwater and Second? Yes. That Kelly had had toward the end of her presentation. Tom O'Brien, Oregon City. I have a, a safety suggestion or safety-related suggestion 
regarding that intersection. On the intersection, as it's laying out now, without the island, and I think the island is a tremendous idea. I really like the safety issue of that. But if you go to that intersection today, you will see that the vehicle motorists start their left turn coming down the hill about here and sometimes cut clear over into this lane <laughs> to make that bend. Keeping in mind that with the approval of the South End concept plan, even though it's a really tight traffic situation today, particularly up here at this intersection, the four-way stop, they intend to double the traffic volume through that intersection as that plan is implemented. I would suggest a consideration of doing something such as been done on 7th Street uh, by the Dutch Brothers of putting in some barrier to force people to go a little further <coughs> before making that corner or you're going to find them crossing, coming up onto that island. Uh, we've seen other examples I know in Canby where and in downtown Oregon City at 14th and at 16th where people have taken out the signposts in the middle of the islands uh, simply because they were not paying attention. And I think that's a considerable risk at this intersection that they're going to go up on that island or go to the left of the island and hit somebody head on. So that's my comments. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a great idea. And I saw Kelly writing notes. I did. Yeah. Actually, Kelly, you want to answer on what Jim was talking about? Save me answering it. <laughs> that was the last public comment. That was the last public comment. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so the advisory group, um, Jim made a similar comment actually at um, the planning commission. Um, I think, is that true? Yeah, and Paul actually had asked me to give more information yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah. And, and so Jim had brought that uh, property up at planning commission and then he um, sent me some information on it. Uh, from back when the city purchased that property. Uh, and so we have that on file and we'll share that with the planning commission um, at the next hearing. Uh, but the advisory group was able to um, kind of react to that at, at their December meeting. And, um, and that and some other suggestions for trails uh, above Old Kanima Park or within part of the north part of it or the uphill part of it. Um, and what the advisory group said was, these are great ideas. Um, and it sounds like more of a nature trail experience, uh, whereas the McLaughlin to Kanima Trail is a paved, hard surface shared use path that's intended for bicycles and pedestrians. Nature trail, you know, in, in kind of these sensitive uh, areas that have um, steep slopes and uh, a lot of tree cover and a lot of um, uh, potentially natural uh, natural resource overlay district, you know, wetlands and streams and such, um, that, that a less impactful, unpaved, like four foot wide nature trail uh, might be more appropriate there. Um, and that's kind of what the suggestion was to PRAC to kind of take a look at the opportunities for additional trails in the area. Um, but not to include them in the McLaughlin and Kanima Trail plan. Uh, so I think that's the gist of what the advisory group recommended. Um, these are great ideas, and they should definitely be investigated, um, but they're outside the scope of the project here. Any other comments, questions? Um, I was just going to say, I. I didn't even want that second street crossing included in the final plan. Um, I was on the work group. I've observed the traffic at that location, and Tom, you're so right. <laughs> I, um, that crossing has nothing to do with what we're proposing right now. 
the current plan would be to come down Tumwater, go down, as I jokingly told Mick, make everybody walk by the still house just in case they want to stop in <laughs> and cross at the light there where there's actually some control of the traffic. Not perfect, but some. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the, exist the plan, as Kelly originally showed it, is what we're recommending. There's some options in the future depending on changes, but that's not the gist of what's being proposed here. And I have to say, I watched the Planning Commission presentation. Um, most of you know me and know I'm not shy about sharing my input and opinions. If I'm interested in something going on in the city, I give my input. Prior to the meeting, prior to planning, if there is a work group put together, they've got my input. I might attend the meetings and give them a little more. But when a work group is done with a project, I've got a real problem with somebody going to a committee and saying, well, but why don't you change this? This task force really worked and really listened, weighed a lot of options, and it just bothers me that there's never an end to, well, couldn't you do this different? We've looked at that. And um, this was a, one of the best work groups I've ever had the honor to be part of. Um, so, you know, personally, my feeling is I would like to approve exactly what's presented here, hope it goes to the Planning Commission and comes intact out of them <laughs> and gets to the City Commission intact because the work group did their job. And, you know, an hour, 40, 45, half hour, 45 minutes listening to a presentation, I don't think opens the door to make further refinements to what's in front of us. Stump speech over. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? So Kelly, what you're asking for is um, uh, prop to uh, make a motion and, and send a recommendation to the Planning Commission and City Commission to adopt the trail plan. Is that correct? Yes, please. Okay. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? There you have it. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Very. Thank you, Kelly. <clears throat> Okay, on to general business, crack goals review. Uh, so as this is the, the first meeting of uh, the year and the first meeting of this group, as we have a couple new members, um, there are attachments. I brought hard copies in case anyone wanted to, to see a hard copy. I can pass these around. Um, uh, one of the items in the packet is the crack goals. Uh, which were adopted by CRAC last, uh, last winter. Um, these are goals that were uh, reviewed using previous goals that had been adopted by CRAC, as well as looking at the, the current uh, items on the agenda for the city commission. Um, the, other, the other item that is going around and was in your packet is the um, city commission goals and the um, community services goals as they relate to the city commission goals, uh, of which uh, many of them are also uh, associated with, uh, with PRAC and are items that we've discussed previously. So um, my intent with, with this, again, with the review is to, to maybe, again, review this, make sure that it's still, these are still our priorities as a group, uh, we don't need to make decisions tonight. Obviously, we can come back in February and decide if we'd like to make any adjustments or if this, um, you know, additions or or if we're we're good with the what we have already decided previously. So at that, I'll open it up for discussion. Um, it, it has been a while since we we set these, and you know, quite a few things have come up, and we've had quite a few discussions. Um, I think it would warrant revisiting this and maybe um, adjusting, uh, maybe in a work session or something like that, to to just review these and discuss them. Um, one of the things I think I'm thinking about is like the the parks master plan, 
it's it's greatly outdated. Um, we have a lot of development happening, and I have some deep concerns about where we're going with our parks and uh, and future planning for them. So um, that's that's just something I'm a little bit passionate about myself. I'm sure you guys have some of your own. I agree with you about the parks master plan, and I, and I think, uh, Phil, the trails master plan is even older, 04. right? It is. 04. And, and 04. the parks master plan is 07? 08. 08. Eight. Yeah. yeah. They they both need another look. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd get, I guess that when I look at the goals, and we, like Phil said, we can talk about it more next month, but there's, there's a couple of items down on the additional items that I would like to see get above the line there and get up there is a little more formal goal. Um, and one would be the off-leash dog area pilot project and the other uh, looking at funding for construction of the Filbert Run neighborhood park. Yeah, I would agree with both of those. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we keep hearing more and more about just the master, about the master plan and the trails master plan that I think it's starting to be blunt and in our face, we need to address it. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Phil, is it still looking like that the waterfront front master plan review is, is gonna be in this time frame? Correct, yeah. So with the um, the Clackamas Park master plan will be uh, will be done in this current biennium. Um, we're anticipating uh, moving forward with the RFP uh, within the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And okay. uh, we have, um, uh, should be going forward to um, commission during a work session, probably, uh, probably in March, I would assume. I had one more comment <clears throat> in the same area that Mike was talking about, moving it up above the line. But I think probably perhaps one of the most important items in the bullet point is increase increase community involvement and input into regarding i'm talking about master planning or maybe other parks that uh, need <coughs> help whether it's a guidance or whatever it may be but i know we have uh Atkinson park is one proposal in in, uh, in our neighborhood that we'd like to so i think that that's really an important item um just simply because there's so many that don't have any kind of master planning behind those uh, facilities Yeah, and I think, I think that all goes hand in hand with, um, well, I think it all converges, right? We, we, we've had discussion about the current SDC fees and they're probably outdated. We probably need to revisit that. And I think, I think we need to kind of spur that conversation. And I have to say, when I was doing my homework for the meeting, I hadn't looked at the parks master plan for a while. It was a wonderful stroll down memory lane. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize how old it was. <laughs> I was around when that was developed. Um, we had a, an outside consultant helping us through that process. Is that something that you're entertaining again as an idea to guide us through a, a redo of the master plan? Yes, we would hire a consultant to help walk us through that process. Is it possible to piggyback both that and the trails simultaneously? Uh, same possibly. contractor and whatnot? Yeah, possibly. It seems like a good use of our funds. Mm -hmm. And remind me, Phil, on the SDC front, um, I think you know that came up during the um, commission work session um, recently. And is there an effort to revisit that or, or do some analysis on it? Yes. So the um, and we'll get into so in the the planning line item that we have on the agenda for tonight, we'll get into a little bit of uh, okay. kind of our planning efforts and prioritization and um, some of that. The SDCs, um, as as we discussed at our December meeting, um, and was noted as a priority moving forward to to really look at um, to make sure that the SDCs were appropriate for all the the growth that we're seeing that we're able to build out at the same rate that we're seeing new development happen uh, with our park system. Um, so SDC's uh, planning updating can be done with uh, SDC funds, whereas most of our other planning efforts are typically done with, with general funds and typically, uh, well, I won't say typically, um, for our undeveloped parks, we can use a combination of SDCs and general funds for 
our existing parks. We cannot use SDC funds for planning and our planning um, money in our in our budget is, is not much. And so uh, it has to be done very strategically in order to make sure that we're capitalizing in the best way possible. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So what I'm hearing as the group is maybe we will um, let this soak in a little bit. We'll come back in uh, February and discuss and possibly make adjustments. That's good. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Park operations facility. Thank you. So um, as many of you are aware, uh, we um, had a, a uh, proposal for the park operations facility to be constructed. Uh, we came to the uh, PRAC committee in December uh, to lay out a plan which would have included uh, using uh, some general funds as well as reallocation of, um, of funds within line items in the community services budget. Uh, additionally, looking at using approximately $350,000 out of park system development charges. Um, the city commission um, considered that proposal, considered the recommendation of PRAC not to use SDCs and wanting to keep with um, using the SDCs on park acquisition and park development, knowing that, again, we're um, very park deficient in certain areas of our community and that those funds are very badly needed to make sure that we're keeping pace with development. Uh, the um, during the work session, the city commission asked that we come back during a general meeting uh, to present the topic again. And during that second meeting with the city commission for the general meeting, they uh, voted to support using system development charge uh, funds for the park operations facility. So that would, um, again, give us a uh, $1.3 million in funds total, uh, which is the anticipated budget for the park operations facility. That would include using the, um, the one acre property adjacent to the current park operations facility, all the demo work and reconstruction of a larger shop space, as well as additional parking and some site work on, on the recently acquired property. Uh, it would also include uh, updated restroom facilities for users of the cemetery, uh, which are very desperately needed. So. Uh, right now, we're in the process of uh, determining next steps for um, an RFP process, uh, whether we'll go th with a um, typical RFP and bid process for, for documents or a CMGC uh, method, which we also sometimes use for developing of our facilities. Um, that was the, the method that was used most recently for the library. Um, so we'll be going through those steps, um, have probably a little bit more information to share at the February meeting. Uh, we're pretty, pretty new in this process and kind of working through making sure we have all of our uh, items in a row to, to move forward. So um, if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but it's more of just a communication. Moving on. Point of Fiscal House. Thank you. Uh, so Buena Vista House, uh, we have um, been working with a, a consultant to provide facilitation services for uh, walking through with stakeholders um, what to do next with the Buena Vista House. As you're aware, it is located within uh, Atkinson Park and uh, is another one of our um, sites that has a pretty substantial deferred maintenance backlog, both within the park as well as the facility itself. Uh, we have a group of stakeholders that have um, identified this as a priority for them and um, we would agree as, as staff that needing to have some type of structure moving forward on how to approach the facility. It is um, eligible for um, recognition on the uh, historic registry so uh, it is you know very important to the community uh, culturally. Uh, within the Buena Vista community and with the McLaughlin neighborhood. And uh, we're anticipating to reach out to the stakeholders within the next week or so. Um, with that, it would be my request to, to this group is to probably have a representative from PRAC to mm -hmm. represent PRAC and to continue to carry information back uh, to this group um, as we move through the process. So we're anticipating probably having a um, 
uh, info sharing kind of uh, meeting, having additional um, meetings where we're kind of going through the information and trying to come to a resolution on next steps and best approach on how to tackle the deferred maintenance backlog and how to um, make the, the best, uh, best step forward for the facility. So if there's any interest of uh, anyone in the group to, to serve on that um, committee. I'm the new kid, but I would be interested. Do you have any other interest as well? I would be interested if nobody else wants to step forward. Okay. Um, and I think if, uh, I, I don't know, with you being pretty involved in the um, McLaughlin Neighborhood Association, uh, the stakeholder group that's already been identified, probably having a, a different representative of PRAC would be most appropriate. That's fine. So um, we have Karen as a uh, nominee and probably just have a, have a vote to, to see if that's supported by the group. That's supported. I'll, I'll, I'll volunteer. You, you would like to volunteer to, to serve as well? Well, yeah, if you're looking for another person. Okay, then. great. Um, so we probably would need to have a, a motion and then a, a vote. So are you looking for two? Probably two, uh, one or two. I mean, it, um, whatever would be most appropriate. Uh, we have, um, at, at this point, Bill, do you know, I, I've met with probably six or so individuals, uh, stakeholders that have interest in the property. Right, and there'll be more neighbors that'll also be involved. Yeah, you can have yeah. So probably putting together a, a small working group of, of folks that would have interest in, in putting that together. Uh, so yeah, if we have, I, we just can't have a um, quorum amongst this group there. So yeah, I guess anything less than five would I guess be appropriate, but knowing that, <laughs> knowing that time is uh, something that we all need more of, I, I do appreciate folks' interest in wanting to serve. So Phil, do we need an actual motion and, and vote on this? Or is this just a... I, I don't know that we, it, it's up to you. I mean, the, yeah. if the group wants to uh, make that. I, I fully support the, the two volunteers and think it's yeah. great. Yeah, I don't okay. think there'd be any discussion. Yeah. Great, cool. okay. Before so we I've, move on, I'd like to make just a quick comment. Okay, yeah. And as you know, Denise McGriff, Oregon City, this is this is one of my little babies, and I've been working with Karen a few places. So just for future agendas, it is the Buena Vista Buna. Clubhouse. Wayne. The group uh, was the Buena Vista Civic Improvement Club was their name, and they were responsible for moving the two little buildings that came out of the McLaughlin neighborhood correctly, correct? that got moved up to the park and became one building. So, and I can't explain to you why it's Buena Vista. It's the same reason that Estacada is called Estacada and not Estacada. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta go with the flow. But. And as I explained to Denise, it's yes. Buena Vista because it looked really good in a real estate brochure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's one of those odd little pronunciations. So we, uh, and as Phil said, yes, we have received a letter from the uh, State Historic Preservation Office that the building is uh, definitely eligible, and not only because not because of its architectural significance, but basically the social significance and the people that were associated with it. And uh, myself and a few other people put together information listing. I mean, these were not famous people, but it's amazing where all the people who were involved in the formation of the club lived in the neighborhood before there was a connection between Buena Vista and the rest of the town because there was a big gap and you couldn't get there and that's why they were complaining and they decided to do something about it so it's really your first citizen involvement group I think in Oregon City you know technically it w well with the exception of the Oregon City Women's Club I would say they were probably first because they formed to nope, move Buena Vista is a little older a little older so you've got you've got a lot of citizen involvement going on in Oregon City from the very very early days of its beginnings where people came together and said hey we can work together and we can do something that benefits our community. And that's um, our goal to, uh, and I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Todd Eislin, who couldn't be here tonight. That's our goal is to move this project forward 
Um, I'm also participating as McLaughlin neighborhood representative in the Ladderette Park project. And again, that's a bunch of people got together, decided something needed to be done, it's getting done. So we've got such a good example we're going to do with project number two. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, we'll probably be keeping this as a standing item moving forward in the next couple of months to keep the group updated. Great. Okay. Parks and Rec planning overview. So I'm uh, going to be passing along a spreadsheet. You can grab one and pass it down. Did I see enough at work today? What? Spreadsheet. Oh, did I see enough at work today? Oh, this is a giant one. Oh, good. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> work. Small, small print, a lot of information. Somebody click on that. Somebody left. So, on the color oh, <laughs> so sorry. Um, so this this is a document that uh, gives you a little bit of an overview on uh, planning that has happened and may be scheduled to happen in the near future uh, for parks and recreation facilities and plans in general. Um, this came about, uh, Bill Daniels reached out to me and asked if we could talk about uh, the Atkinson Park master plan and wanting to, oh, thank you, uh, wanting to move forward with um, discussions on the master plan for Atkinson Park. And uh, I thought that was a great idea, but that maybe we wanted to also review kind of just the planning in general, um, plans that we have in place and plans that probably will need to happen in the, the upcoming years. As you've noted in uh, the couple of other items that we've discussed this evening, uh, we are in need of updating of our Parks and Recreation Master Plan as well as our Trails Master Plan. And um, we have a couple of other um, plans that are either underway or uh, should be underway soon in relation to our park system. So if you're looking at the top section, that's kind of our, our system plans, our larger uh, scale plans, uh, which include the uh, Parks and Recreation System Master Plan, Capital Improvement Plan, Trail System Master Plan, uh, Park System Development Charges, uh, our budget, and strategic plan. Uh, the next grouping is our uh, Parks Master Plans, and those are individual parks and master plans that have taken place. This is a draft version. Um, I uh, am sure that we probably have some, some other plans that uh, are out there that I was not able to, to find over the, the last week, but um, as readily available as I could find them, this is a, a somewhat comprehensive list of, of master plans that have taken place for our parks. And then down below we have our trails plans and facility plans. Um, the reason for uh, laying, laying it out this way is to show uh, kind of the, the need for the park system and uh, to help us as we're kind of going through and trying to prioritize planning efforts uh, specifically for, um, you know, individual sites uh, in relation to how we're doing our planning efforts for our, our overall systems plans. Um, you know, money is one thing in order to, to find the funds in order to, to produce these documents, but also staff time is important to recognize that we have a very limited amount of staff that have time that they can dedicate towards the master planning process. Uh, mainly myself, John Waverly is the, the park maintenance manager and Denise Conrad is the assistant parks and recreation director. So having those three individuals and the amount of planning that, that needs to take place uh, for our parks and facilities um, uh, we get pulled in different directions uh, all the time and it's difficult to, to always find the time in order to dedicate to uh, the planning efforts, even if we have the money to, to do the planning work. So um, at, at that, I guess I will open it up to, to Bill to um, maybe if you want to talk a little bit about you know, your request for Atkinson Park and then maybe we can have a discussion or open it up to questions as the group or discussion as the group for uh, kind of master planning or planning in general for the park system. I can make this brief, but I will <clears throat> say that enough people are interested in, in the, um, <clears throat> the master planning of Atkinson Park to see it go forward. Uh, and what we're looking for is um, <clears throat> some 
concepts about what what order or what, what direction we should go besides the basic kinds of maintenance that are, are apparent. I think there's a guideline that people would like to see certain amenities in those parks, in, in that park in particular. Um, and um, possibly if SDC fees are, are um, uh, one of the options that may um, be included in the master planning process to get um, lighting in a park that hasn't had lighting um, or pathways that there aren't. There's essentially a pathway that um, um, is somewhat functional. But I think that there's a number of people who would like to use that facility again and feel safe while they're there using it. It's, it's certainly um, um, out of the way, should we say. And um, it's a beautiful park with a lot of uh, uh, Douglas fir trees in it and, and some uh, deciduous hardwood trees, maples, etc. And I think a lot of the, uh, the area, I think, um, has been neglected for quite some time. And it's not uh, only because staffing on the, in the Oregon City Parks is 50% um, of what it should be or could be. Uh, that, that doesn't get the kind of maintenance that, and uh, maybe even just attention that it that it deserves. Um, so part of that master pl planning process would probably be um, talking about whether we have dog run in the park, be an area for people to to um, have a f whether it's fenced or unfenced. But those kinds of issues is what I think we're trying to decipher in. Um, Maybe at some point in time, use the Buena Vista House as an opportunity to, to gather, whether it's for work parties, uh, for equipment to um, meet the staff who might deliver tools or leave tools in the building to, um, to use in the, uh, in the park. I think that's where we're at at this point. Thank you. Yes. You or me? You go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I just wrote some notes as I was looking down through this of, of well, basically more information that I think would help benefit me as I look through this and hopefully the rest of them. Um, one would be in the large section of parks. I'm curious if on the ones that have master plans, if those master plans have been executed fully. Mm. So in other words, do we have some where we have a master plan sitting and we haven't used it yet? Because uh, then I look at that as a, we've already identified the need, we should finish that project type of a, that, that's where my mind's headed. Um, and, and if not, uh, like Richard Bloomtop's park, that was one that just kind of stuck out. I, I kind of forgot we had a master plan on that. So is, for example, that master plan 100% complete? Mm. Uh, or Wesley Lynn, I see your note, uh, master plan needed for phase two. So it's good to indicate that 2002 plan as just a phase one so mm -hmm. that's a partial um, it would also help me from a, uh, you know each of us represent different neighborhoods across the city and and I think there it's important to have an equitable balance of adequate parks through the city it would be beneficial to see these broken down or grouped by neighborhood mm. so you could kind of then uh, hopefully judge well, that neighborhood's got a bunch of brand new parks or that neighborhood hasn't been touched in 15 years. We, I'm, we may find that easier to see if they're grouped. Yeah. Um, so um, I, did, I did run that. Uh, it's pretty quick to, to pull on the spreadsheet that I have. Oh, it has yeah. that, so I can send that out to you okay. guys. You have that it, it's a great good. document. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It's a number them along the side. Oh, okay. So the the request to, to number them along the side, um, just repeating for the microphone. So I, I, I just resort it by neighborhood association yeah. instead yeah. of alphabetical. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. This is a great document. I've never seen one like this before yeah, presented to PRAC. Yeah. We'll stop making fun of you now. <laughs> <laughs> oh. On this subject. Okay, Phil, in the um, priority column, those that are um, have something in there, what, what, oh yeah, H&M. High and medium. What drives that? What, yeah, how? so, so um, I guess. as I was putting the document together, uh, the only ones that I did note 
of uh, priority. So in my mind, thinking high priority are systems plans that we need in place in order to drive the direction that we're heading. So the Parks and Rec Master Plan, uh, plans that are basically required to do, such as budgeting, um, uh, anything that is, uh, those types of plans are, are a high priority to keep them updated as, as often as, as needed. Um, the other ones that I listed high for Clackamas Park as it is a uh, goal of commission. Um, <coughs> DC Laterate Park as uh, we have um, grants in place and very strong public support, community support around that project. Um, and then uh, the other parties are basically uh, not listed. I did do a very, very rough, and I that's why I didn't want to bring it tonight. <laughs> no, I get it. I get rough it. version of a prioritized kind of looking at the next five years for um, how we want to identify plans that should be done in, in the next five years. Um, and uh, on that, I looked at um, two different things. One, uh, what's the park designation? And so looking at either um, probably not not pocket parks as uh, they're fairly small in nature and are the, the usage uh, area um, is, is fairly small. Um, and then so looking at uh, neighborhood or community parks that either have not had a phase two developed and were intended to have a phase two that don't have plans such as Wesley Lynn or um, uh, like Park Place, which has a uh, master plan that was developed um, seemingly looking over the document before the city was was really involved, looked like the, the county was pretty heavily involved in the master plan work and um, that it phase one was developed and there was additional um, question marks around what phase two may look like and so probably needing to update that document anyway as it was um, you know more than 20 years old 25 years old so um, so those are the the types of things that I was thinking about as I was putting together what a, a prioritized list might look like Atkinson Park is, is another example of a, of a park that uh, is a uh, neighborhood park that's never had a that I was able to find uh, master plan done and it is a it's a great property I and mean, if you've spent any amount of time up there especially on a, a nice warm uh, summer day and just the the shade the canopy cover uh, the views uh, as close as you are to the neighborhood and then you walk into uh, you know an oasis <laughs> really in effect uh, so close to housing so um, so those are the things that I took into consideration as I was trying to put together what a prioritized list might look like. Um, kind of anecdotally, I know that the master plan and the trails plan need to happen. Um, and those should be our, our first and top priorities as we move into the next budget cycle. No, I think this, this is good. I think actually you could probably utilize this to develop or update the master plan too. I mean, this, this mm -hmm. is good information. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, something that i think we'll you know ultimately have to consider when we we revisit the master plan and maybe we can factor it into this or, or incorporate it is um maybe the the communities that are underserved now with parks um or where there's there's uh development earmarked you know mm -hmm. based on housing and and development mm -hmm. um what, what does the future look like there but i think this this might be helpful with that that's a great point yeah. i've got two more things okay um okay. Go ahead. No, that's right. Go ahead. <laughs> You're on a roll. Keep going. I, well, I keep writing notes. Um, <laughs> but, and it doesn't necessarily directly go to this document, um, but looking through and reminding myself of some of these pocket parks, <laughs> pocket parks, it just made me curious what Mr. Nasita brought up earlier is I wonder how many of these pocket parks in particular have um, have those lands that are city owned on either side of them that are supposed to be right of ways that aren't being used. And I know we have policies related now towards park size and we would never have some of those pocket parks, but it made me wonder if some of those would be an appropriate size if they were consumed, if they consumed that other adjacent mm -hmm. land. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, um, a good, that's a good point. Good thought. The one in yeah. And then the second one, it really for Bill, I got on prac in 2003 you were on in 2002. I didn't know Chapin had a master plan. So is is this, <coughs> I, I'm wondering if that's our oldest one that's never been executed. 
Yeah, I didn't know that either. Okay. Just of interest, Phil, maybe if you mm-hmm. answer that question down the road. It, I don't, I think that's a, like a 16 year old plan that's never been touched. Mm-hmm. For Chapin? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's what I, it appears like. Yeah, and I can, um, one of my goals is to try to get our planning documents actually onto the website because we don't have any of our planning documents uh, beyond the, um, the the trails and the parks and recreation master plan and then the newer Glen Oak and Filbert run on the on the website. So um, if that one specifically, I can probably load that up fairly easily um, so that it, for public viewing. Um, but yeah, I there's definitely a lot of lot of documents to <laughs> to read through and and determine what the intent of those documents were and if they've been met. Chris, yes, I, I hate to say this because it, it's the biggest and most expensive and hardest one to do, but I, I don't I don't see how you can prioritize master plans for individual parks if we don't update the parks master plan first because yeah. Yeah. we're going to yeah. lean our ladder up against the wrong tree if we don't step back and take a look at the big picture so absolutely um and the other thing and this is this is just kind of curiosity so since the the clackamat park master plan is on the commission's goal mm-hmm. has there been any consideration of, of, of expanding that really and and talk about clackamat john storm and sport craft because they're they're really of a piece mm-hmm. there. I don't think it makes sense to look at a master plan for Clackamat if you don't see how the other two fit into it. The um, the waterfront master plan that was, I, I think it was 2002 maybe was the document, uh, which looked at basically from uh, 205 all the way through the Cove property, all the water frontage um, of that. Clackamat Park was a piece of that plan. Um, uh, it was very... Um, kind of business oriented, I guess uh, I would say. So opportunity driven, as opposed to um, specific in in the outcomes. Um, so it said very, you know, oh, you could do this, or this might be an option. And when development comes in, you might be able to. And so, um, but one of the one of the recommendations that I think was pulled from that was John Storm's development as a park. Um, and it also laid out uh, the Cove property as uh, possibly an expansion of regional park facility, which would be kind of an expansion of uh, Clackamas Park. Um, the master plan work that we're going to be looking at for Clackamas specifically will also look at uh, the properties across the street, uh, which are adjacent to McDonald's, as well as uh, really evaluating the uh, boat ramp and the RV park. Um, but your uh, you're requesting that maybe we expand and, and look at John Storm and Sportscraft as as kind of a, um, an extension of, of the Clackamas Park plan. Yeah, because I, I think I think users would look at that as, as you know one, what's offered in this whole kind of whole area. How does, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no boundary line to the user. No. Right, and we've tried to make that make it that way, right? With the trails <laughs> connecting them. All right, it is right. discontinued. Yeah, just a thought. It'd just be interesting, if nothing else, even if the name doesn't change on the plan that we're working on, but when the surveys go out, you want to include questions that are directly related to adjacent sides and to make sure we're addressing those appropriately or mm. we're, we're still staying consistent. Yeah, and, and part of that also, just uh, uh, something to, to be considering, the Cove property as, uh, as proposed for development would include um, what they're calling North Park, which is, I, I think it's around an eight acre um, facility, which is um, up close to the um, West water treatment plant um, and between the, the trail and the Cove property. And then it would continue along what they're calling an esplanade, um, but was the, the trail that, that kind of looped through the Cove. Um, in addition to that, they're calling for a nature play element, which would be a little further south um, closer to um, Clackamas Park. So there are some, some additional elements there that also will be kind of wrapped into kind of how we're viewing that whole corridor. And those those aspects would be as part of the development of, of the cove. So there would be no, um, in theory, no uh, additional um, support from, from Parks and Rec. We would take over, in theory, those properties. 
So uh, I, I guess just, again, if you have additional questions, I'll send out the, the raw data. You can kind of sort and, and pick and pull information. Feel free to give me input, uh, anything that I know we have a lot of very knowledgeable folks on this on this committee that have uh, historical context that I might not have. So if you find information, you want to share it, or if you uh, have things that we should be considering as we're starting to look at uh, prioritization for uh, planning, I would uh, gladly appreciate any input that you can you can give. <clears throat> any other questions or comments? Okay, move on. Hermitinger House. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, House, this is a, a standing item on uh, our agenda. Uh, we've been working on continuing to uh, work on the furniture plan and so making sure we have um, appropriate pieces in each of the rooms as much as possible, uh, utilizing the vision document um, to, to work through that. Uh, we've had some conversations with the friends group in relation to the uh, operation of the facility. Um, we have um, plans to open up the facility uh, by the summer, uh, whether it's through the, the friends group or the city operating uh, the house uh, in order to get it open for the, um, the summer season. So um, at this point, we're um, just plugging along. <clears throat> Any other general business? Right. Member reports. We'll start with Bill. I have none. I have none. March 10th is a solve cleanup at Mountain View Cemetery. Sign up online. You'll hear more later. Thank you. <laughs> Mike, nothing. I just wanted to make a comment on the moving to the park that I was really pleased to see the idea of moving around. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I think Wesley Lynn is a great place. However, I thought the idea of stretching out, trying other places was also really good. And I've kind of heard comments from other people about that, too. Oh, okay. good. Who knows what we're going to see in the sense it may be a flop, but you got to try it. Um, so from park place, um, I don't know if you've heard anything we said, but I've, there's, I've heard quite a bit of feedback and comments from neighbors about the recent public notice that went out for the 92 acres that, that uh, the developer wants to uh, develop between Holcomb and Redland Road and actually put Holcomb through to Redland. Um, and of course, as always, the question of parks comes up of, you know, does the city have a plan for a park? Um, right now, that's no. We haven't done any land banking, and, and that brought up a recent conversation with city commission about that. Um, on the other side of uh, Holcomb Road, there's more development. Uh, I think two more parcels were annexed in, large parcels that are being developed. So um, I think that's going to be a ongoing um, discussion point for those neighbors of, of when um, and if a park's going to go in that, that area. So just want to put that out there on public record that that's being discussed. I've heard the same things, Chris. Um, the steering committee is well aware of the 92 acres, um, and that's more on the Redland side. Um, I think there's two or three parks that are planned, um, but that would not really assist the folks, especially on the east side towards Bradley of Holcomb of Park Place. Um, so that that is a concern. Um, I've heard that multiple sources as well. Um, so I would, I would agree. Um, I'd like to echo that. Um, as far as my member report, uh, busy with water board. We've been working on water board here and there um, as we can. Um, and uh, just, uh, just some very informal um, clipping and things like that. I think a couple of other uh, neighbors are doing, doing some work there as well. Uh, whenever I go up there on the weekends, um, you can see crush ivy <coughs> being pulled. So it's coming along. So doing well. That's it. Roger. Okay, um, updates for the Pioneer Center. 
the annual funding appeal is winding down and most of the contributions have come, come in. We are currently at 18,635. Um, the C's candy sales went well and we will do that again next year. We make close to $500. Um, the entertainment books are poor sellers and we may end up that fundraising arm. Um, we only sold about three books this year. People can get them cheaper at Costco. Holiday reef sales were good and we had about 150 sold this year. Tax appointments are filling up fast and we are already into March for appointments. Classes are growing, even the regular classes like painting where we have 31 students at this time. Um, as far as the Parks Foundation, we just um, last weekend had an auction, a uh, fundraising auction at the Hive Tap House up on Beaver Creek Road. And it was really pretty successful. We had a good show up and, um, and it was, it was a great, great event for us to- uh, Terrific event. Yeah. And um, we're continuing on with uh, Pioneer Center, or excuse me, the prominent, uh, McLaughlin Prominent Park um, planting and um, and the water power park, of course, like Lisa said. So that's on our agenda this year. That's it for me. Okay. Um, so the recreational report, I just handed out. No, uh, Denise sent it out uh, somewhat recently, and uh, you have a paper copy as well. Uh, a couple of other items. Uh, staff are putting together a grant um, proposal for Filbert Run Park. And so we're anticipating going after state park grant funds for Filbert Run, uh, which a uh, similar process to, to Gun Oak Park um, uh, deadline around April notification, I'm sorry, um, presentation to the committee uh, in May, June, and then a notification uh, in late June, early July, uh, maybe August. So um, fingers crossed, we'll be coming back with additional information and uh, going out to neighborhood associations and uh, seeking additional support. Uh, so we'll probably be requesting a, um, a letter of support from this group. Uh, so if maybe at one of the upcoming meetings, we can make a, a formal designation for a vote of support to have the chair write a, a letter of recommendation, that would be fantastic. Um, the other item, ODOT is uh, going to be getting work on their 99E project, uh, both clearing vegetation along the bluff as well as uh, making um, adjustments on the, the wire meshing and removing some of the rocks that might have fallen uh, between the last time that they did the clearings and, and this time. Uh, work on the vegetation removal is scheduled to, to happen during the month of February, so between February 1st and March 1st. And so you'll see um, some lane closures down on 99E, as well as possibly some impact on the promenade um, as they might need to close sections for up to 20 minutes at a time. Uh, should see fairly minimal impact and they don't anticipate working on the weekend, so it'll probably be uh, primarily during the week. Um, yeah, Bill. Quick question on, the, on those locust trees against the wall. Have they, have they defined how close they are coming to the wall with their scope of work? Uh, for those, they are removing all of the uh, trees and vegetation on that side of the wall. And the ones that are real, there's one tree in particular that is I mean, right up against the wall, uh, which we did identify as, as still needing to be removed. Eventually it would uh, be very detrimental to the, the structure of the wall. So it will be removed. We might have some minor repair that, that might need to happen after the tree is removed. Um, because it, it may have been supporting the tree, the tree may have been supporting the wall at that point. <laughs> was there a regional scope of work up to up to 10 feet from the wall? Wasn't that what was mentioned at one time? Mm -hmm. there, you know? Yeah, so the uh, original scope of work was uh, 10 feet from the uh, bluff, so in the, um, the surface area on the top of the bluff, uh, 10 feet back from the corner of the, the bluff to the wall, towards the wall. Um, some areas it's you know 10 feet would take you into the park um, in other areas there's there's still a little bit of, of room uh, the most recent updates uh, is 15 feet and they will be clearing all of the major uh, vegetation any of the trees any of the woody 
uh, vegetation that's up there will be removed completely and then uh, painted uh, with an herbicide treatment to make sure it doesn't regrow. Will there be any impacts on that parking lot? Um, most likely not. Um, they had a um, construction meeting, which was this week, and I haven't heard back from ODOT in relation. They, they can't dictate how the work happens. Um, they can only say the work needs to happen. And so after the construction meeting, they're supposed to get back with us and let us know if there's going to be uh, additional impact. I would assume they would reach out pretty quickly with uh, VFW and let them know. I was say, if, and if you see that, just pass yeah. it my way. I can let people know. Yeah, definitely. And that's all I have for staff reports. Um, Phil, I'm just curious on the um, transient camp cleanup. Is that, does this just seem like a lie? Is that represent an increase in activity or just about the same or? Um, I'm sorry, the transient camp. I'm, know, I'm looking at the, uh, the parks uh, cemetery. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, um, we, we've seen a definite uptick in transient uh, activity in the area within the last year two years, um, I, uh, off, just anecdotally off the top of my head, I, the information I've heard from, they do a, a count every two years in the county, and uh, the percentage increase was something like in the 30 to 40 percent uh, compared to the, the previous time that they had done a homeless inventory. Um, and so we, we've definitely seen an uptick. Uh, if you talk to, to Jonathan Waverly, our park maintenance manager, uh, in regards to you know, he said when he started working, he knew the handful of folks that were um, transients in the area and knew them by name, um, could probably count them on all of his fingers. Um, and now we uh, we have a, a pretty robust uh, homeless population in, in the city. Uh, we have a lot of transient issues around Clackamas, around the Cove, um, Johnstorm Park, um, the Waterboard Park, um, up and down 99E, which is um, public works uh, maintained, but um, they're going back and forth all, yeah. along all those properties. Um, I, as uh, Kelly alluded during the um, presentation, they're seeing um, homeless folks that are um, living underneath the, between 99E and their property. Uh, we're also seeing some at the end of the Oregon Trail. And um, the, um, Mountain View Cemetery and the Newell Creek area metro property. We're seeing a lot of, they're cutting the, the fence between the two properties and moving back and forth. Metro recently hired some security to, to monitor the Newell Creek area a couple times a week. Um, and so what we're seeing is uh, they're kind of jumping onto the other side and then they're jumping back into the Newell Creek area once once cleared. So um, it's difficult and uh, can be um, draining on staff dealing with that regularly. Yeah, thank you. Future agenda items. Chris, I've got two things. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to know, and I guess Phil, we'd need to know from you what uh, what the process would be, what the steps are, costs, whatever. Um, of designating those two pieces of property that Mr. Nasita mentioned um, as part of the Abernathy Park footprint, yeah. mm -hmm. Abernathy mm -hmm. Creek Park. Yeah, I'd like to move on that. So, um, yeah, if you could let us know what that process would be and if there's cost involved and so forth. Okay. Yeah, the two pieces are public works, um, well, they're city owned, public works maintained. Okay. Oh, so maybe the process is just a recommendation from PRAC to include them and then send to the commission and have the commission change the designation. Put a bridge in. That could Future be. Future agenda. Yeah. 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 Um, and the other thing, and I have to ask you a question first, what's the, what is the status, has the city commission adopted the new park fee schedule? Uh, they have, yes. They have, okay. Yes. Um, and have they discussed, or was there discussion of how the special events fees um, particularly how that would relate to nonprofit groups? Uh, that is uh, one of the agenda items on their uh, commission retreat, uh, which is scheduled for this Saturday. So they'll be discussing how they uh, interact with nonprofits, uh, specifically around some of those special events. Um, you know, a lot of the, the downtown um, DACA, um, downtown Oregon City Association, um, DOCA, thank you. 
Daka, that's a different thing. <laughs> uh, Doka and Doka and all the other events that they're having in the, the downtown core, as well as how we interface with some of the, you know, the family fast and things like that. Um, and, you know, at, at what point are we making that delineation and, and how we're uh, either supporting or choosing to interact with them. So that, that is on the agenda for Saturday. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Our next meeting is February 22nd. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Sorry, my apologies. Special. I don't have it on my... Um, yes, the that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> it's the fourth, fourth, fourth Thursday, Thursday of yeah. February uh, is... Yes, February 22nd. Okay. All right. If there's nothing else, we'll... Thanks, Chris. Adjourn. Good job. Oh.